Well, hello everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are watching from. My name is Alastair Roth. I'm the Executive Director of AWI in Victoria, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for your interest. We've got something over 150 people dialing in to, to watch us, so we really appreciate your interest. With a populist president who's been courting controversy really from the beginning, and of course, who now, since yesterday, has the challenge of testing positive to COVID, despite downplaying the risks for, for such a long time, Brazil really is facing some challenges. So to discuss today whether Bolsonaro really is the Trump of the tropics, we're joined from Sydney by Dr. Deborah Farias. Deb is Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at the University of New South Wales. Before coming to Australia, she worked as a trade analyst and policy analyst in, in Canada, Canada and Brazil. And her research interest is developing and rising powers, particularly Brazil. So Deb, it's great to have you with us. Thank you also to our friends at AWI New South Wales for the introduction. Um, I'll hand over to you and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alistair. And thank you so much, everybody, for watching whatever it is that you are there in the world. So I will begin here just by um, a little bit of using here a PowerPoint to, I won't, I won't kill you to death. It will not be death by PowerPoint. It's just to give a little bit of a visual as um, I go and talk about. So the idea is to talk about Bolsonaro as, you know, is he Trump of the tropics? And I'll, before I start, I stumbled upon this image that, I mean, for some would be hesitated even maybe to be using this one, which is like sort of a mashup between the face of the two. But I think if I really want to summarize the, the debate how Bolsonaro and Trump are alike, is that if you like Bolsonaro, you'll like Trump and vice versa. So this is the kind of thing, for instance, I picked this up um, from, you know, just uh, Googling, and it's the sort of thing that you can see the really hardcore Bolsonaro supporters will put the two of them as very close. However, if you do not like Bolsonaro, you're probably not, or do not like Trump, or probably won't like Bolsonaro, and then this is the sort of image that you will see. So just hopefully to start off by showing how polarized this is. So um, one of the first things that one can see when you talk about Bolsonaro and Trump is they are, by their, by their politics, by the way that they see the world, that they've been leading their countries, they are figures that are very polarizing. And most people either really like them or really hate them. Hence, the image is there. So what I'll try to do here is just, I'll put myself here in the bottom, is just to go a little bit. So these are 10 elements because, of course, this is something that I could go on for a long time. I won't. But there's a lot of stuff to be said. So what I'll try to do is just to summarize along these sort of 10 topics, sort of putting them together. The first thing here when I mention change is because these are two men that were elected in basically in a platform of change and change in the sense of, a, of course, everyone who's going for election, they're going to say that they're different from whoever was in place. But both of them represent a deeper sort of proposal for change in terms of the status quo. Now, because most people already know Trump, obviously, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Bolsonaro. And what happened in Brazil was there has been a, a sense of growing um, polarization in, in the, the, the country's politics. And I mean, even for Latin American standards, even for Brazilian standards, um, this is a very, very high level of, of uh, polarization. That's been really increasing pretty much since 2013. Um, I don't know if you remember, but basically in 2013 when was when you begin to see some of the, the, the all these like really, really big uh, public manifestations in Brazil against not just President then Dilma Rousseff, but against sort of the, the status quo in general. So a lot of complaints about corruption, a lot of concern about where the country was headed. This sort of led to one of the first main ruptures, which was Dilma Rousseff's impeachment in um, 2016. And by then already, the country was already quite polarized, as it remains in many ways um, until now. So it's not that Bolsonaro piggybacked on Trump's call for the status quo, because it, it's important also to say that 
one of the big differences from Bolsonaro to Trump is that Bolsonaro has been in politics for about 30 years. So in that sense, you can even make a comparison probably close, closer to um, Duterte in the Philippines that has this very long history. Um, I mean, compared to Trump that had no history in being in, in politics. So it is a change because he's been in politics, but he was never in a leadership position. He was never um, in any sort of executive role as a governor, mayor, let alone um, president. And because of a lot of controversies uh, surrounding the Workers' Party, um, it's a very long story that would be then another webinar, but essentially Bolsonaro won and has been uh, Brazil's president since January of last year. So he has about a year and a half. Um, the problem is that change by saying you don't want to be like the previous person necessarily mean a specific platform um, for action. And that's where a lot of problems have been going. I can obviously discuss that more in Q&A, but essentially the point is to make that they both come uh, to the political scene. I think in this sense that it's about, again, a rupture with the system. Now, what they really have in common, and I think these are probably the main elements in terms of substance, in terms of content of style, has to do with this um, right-leaning populist approach to politics, which, and I, again, it's easy to say, well, populist is, is an easy, it's a word that's sort of easily thrown around as um, when you don't like someone, you say that they're a populist. The, the point's not that. The point about populism, because you can be in both the left or the right, but it's this idea that you have basically, um, one of the cornerstones of a government is to have this idea of a world divided between us and them. And the people is obviously us. It's construed as this sort of, again, these are three elements. So nationalism, appeal to religion, appeal to uh, not just the path, but a specific view of the past. And it tends to be a rosier version that it's it's proposed as we should go back to when, you know, the, in the good old days. Um, except obviously there is an element of cherry picking as to what those good old days looks like. You kind of put aside the things that didn't work. Um, but both of them have in a, a really strong sense of this sort of division. In the case of Brazil, you'll, you'll find one of the very odd divisions is that in many ways we're living almost in the Cold War because um, one of the things that you get if you criticize Bolsonaro is to say that you're a communist, which um, that has been used for Francis Fukuyama has been called a communist, Marine Le Pen has been called a communist, um, The Economist has been called a communist publication. So it just gets, not necessarily by the president, but by um, the supporters who see this sort of very strong division between um, us and them. By the way, a new poll numbers came out and it, it, it's apparently around steady, around 30% the general population now that um, gives Bolsonaro sort of a good or very good. This was a lot higher a year and a half ago, but now it's at 30%. And for some statistics, the really, really core, the, the almost cult-like following is at about 15% of adults. So again, probably a lot of resonation there with Trump where it comes to a point where it, it's not even about the politics itself, but there is an element of um, the great leader regardless where they go. There is a lot of appeal to nationalism, although in Brazil it does get different contours. We don't have as many of a controversy with uh, refugees or foreign immigrants as it is in the United States. So it's there and it's this vision really of Brazil. Um, and it, it's been interesting also to see how in Brazil uh, there is all the controversy now about wearing the yellow jersey for the Brazilian um, you know, soccer team, which by the way, unfortunately, I think I have to remember today was uh, the day, what, a couple of years ago where we lost seven to one. So it's, it's, a, it's a sad day in our memory. Um, and appeal to religion is, is also another element that's very interesting that links um, Bolsonaro and Trump. And Bolsonaro is quite strong with that. And that's also showing in terms of foreign policy, because you do see, for instance, um, Brazil getting closer to the US, which is a traditional partner, but also to Poland and Hungary. 
and with this idea of so it's not just religion but it's about um christianity and a generally quite conservative view of christianity so it's very specific in that um in that sort of sense um and then you have obviously their appeal to the past which in brazil what is probably most problematic is the discussion that has to do with the dictatorship brazil had a long dictatorship between 1964 and 1984 and well most brazilians don't want dictatorship back but there is a portion of people who are hardcore bolsonaro support to have it back um Again, I can talk about more about that in Q and A in terms of the, the the role of the military in the current government because they do have um, positions. They have political, excuse me, political positions in, in place right now. Another element that's also interesting when you juxtapose these two is really this idea of family and politics. Uh, Bolsonaro has um, three adult sons. He also has, again, similar to Trump, three adult sons from the first marriage, one um, other child from the second marriage, and then a young kid from the third marriage. So they're very, uh, you know, it's, it's again, if for those who don't like them, they'll point out the inconsistencies of this very, apparently very strong approach to religion, but also being divorced and having sort of this troublesome, um, you know, uh, private life. But what matters here is that, and, and this is something that is a bit different than from, from Bolsonaro to Trump, is that when you see the, the, the Trump kids it's really one it's really um ivanka that seems to have sort of this bigger role in terms of policy her in the case of bolsonaro it's different because his three adult sons who he calls by zero one zero two and zero three um they ha they were all elected to political positions even prior to bolsonaro being president so it's it's also it's, it's different than ivanka because she was never elected now these three whether one likes them or not they had been elected all of them basically around rio the state of rio the city of rio where sort of the the clan sort of sits um and so you have here in the picture you have a senator you have a federal congressman and you have a, a local city councilman but all of them play really important roles in um in his decision making process one of his kids especially the one um the one let me see i don't know if you can see but this one sort of right here on the corner um he bolsonaro himself said that his son is really his pit bull when it comes to social media and so a lot of the success that bolsonaro has had through social media has to do with this um participation strong participation from his children now he did try to have this son here um, placed as Brazil's ambassador to the United States but that didn't fly and this one here is involved in a lot a lot of um, how can I put this uh, he is involved well he's being investigated for illegal use of money and criminal act. well things that were even before Bolsonaro were president a lot of there are sort of scandals going on. One thing is for sure, if you follow Brazilian politics, you never get bored. There is always something new um, going on. But it's just to say that there is sort of the hard, hard core of the Bolsonaro presidency is undoubtedly it's it's him and his sons. So his sons have actually tweeted out um, a couple of ministers already. So there's a, they they really speak. Um, they really have their voice. Heard their father whether that's good or bad now one of the sons here Eduardo Bolsonaro was the one that came out with um, he visited the United States many times and um, this was him wearing as you can see a, a Trump 2020 cap a bit earlier in the year and he's the one that they try to he, he did try to push for a couple of months for him to go and be Brazil's um, ambassador to the United States which is the the, the, the biggest embassy I mean in Washington, but it, it really, it, it didn't work. Um, now, one of the reasons also that I flag out this same Eduardo Bolsonaro is that you probably know who this 
to show you here, that's Steve Bannon. And um, this is a tweet from last year where here I'll read it in English, where Eduardo Bolsonaro was saying satisfaction in being the head of the movement for Latin America, Steve Bannon's group. So if you don't know what the movement is, it's basically this idea that Steve Bannon, after he left the Trump um, presidency, he went to Europe and it's this idea of sort of building this sort of think tank organization to um, bring together and join forces with uh, conservative right groups in Europe. In general, long story short, it hasn't really succeeded. It hasn't really done a lot. It has the only thing that's really made it um, big is acting, um, well, helping to elect Salvini in Italy. But other than that, it hasn't really done much. But still, I think it's quite interesting when you see not just then the, the two presidents or how, you know, the states are sort of connected, but to see underlying links. So, um, so Eduardo Bolsonaro has been really strong with Steve Bannon. Um, there has been, so from his group, and he sort of forms um, the head of sort of one of the there, you can say there are a couple of internal groups fighting inside of the, the Bolsonaro presidency to see, not presidency, but power, to see who has more power. And he sort of leads one that's the most ideological, more religious based. So you have people from Breitbart. Um, it's, it's this sort of alt-right sort of line. Um, the other ones that don't have to do with this, but the other one is the military group. So the vice president is um, a retired general. And then you have the others that I think you can put um, more into people who are more focused on economic liberalism. So you have these different groups. Again, that is, I think, an interesting difference from looking at Trump, because with Trump, you really see the Republican Party. Um, although you do have some dissenters like Mitt Romney and you have others that have been, uh, you know, more vocal against Trump, but essentially the United States has a two party system and then you have basically the Republicans really supporting Trump and the debates that you'll have inside the impression that one gets is that they're a lot more about individuals. In the case of the Bolsonaro presidency, no, you will have these sort of different perceptions of which group really should have power and how the state should be conducted. And they they don't play together very nice. I mean, you see a lot of infighting there in the system. Now, another thing that they have, and it is something that's quite common to populists in general, again, whether left or right, I mean, it's the, the use of social media, but it's not just, I mean, everybody uses social media, but it's a very specific use of social media. It's one where it's presented as a way of direct communication. So it's this idea where, for example, Bolsonaro every Thursdays in Brazil, he does a Facebook live session. And the way that he puts it is that it's his idea that he can communicate freely to the people um, without any sort of media interference. Um, misinterpretation or anything. So people who like him, they will say, well, this is good because it's unbiased. They'll like it because they'll say, I feel that, you know, I have this connection. I'm seeing that person. I can tweet, I can send something and they'll go back. Um, the one thing is that Bolsonaro is, is not a, an avid tweeter as is Trump, although I think not everybody could, um, maybe even compared to him in terms of um, world leaders and this, this unfiltered use. Once again, if you like that style, it's a handful. Um, but Bolsonaro, one of the reasons that probably you can also attach even to his election was through the use of these, let's say, alternative channels of communication. But these are also two leaders who, um, are involved in a series of controversies. So they'll have a lot of issues with uh, media. They'll have a lot of issues with, um, it, it's, I mean, a, a pseudo psychological would be, it's, they're not used to being questioned. Uh, I think this also reflects the fact that none of them had had an executive position before because even Bolsonaro having had a legislative position, the Brazilian Congress has over 500 um, 
legislators. So it, it's, it's really hard to sort of, you know, be a big deal and be on the television and be the person. But once you are in any executive position, you are the go-to person, especially in a presidential system. And in many ways, it's you, one would expect that the media would be asking questions. I mean, that's sort of the, the role is to be really questioning and to be, um, I think, to, to be or else you're, you end up being like North Korea, right? Just sort of with a propaganda um, style. But they both have a style where they're very vocal and they both have a style where they tend to double up and they tend to have um, say things that, again, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't have the, the time to list all of the things, but anybody in Brazil would be saying like, can you believe the last thing that, you know, they said? Um, in the case of Brazil, if I already want to talk about climate change and environment, I'll do here just um, an example. And last year when the, the, the fires in the Amazon were raging once again, so to be, to be fair to, to Bolsonaro, there's, there's a pattern of usually in the second half of the year because it's a drier season is when you have um, you have fire and, and, and clearings in the Amazon. Now that is normal up until a certain point. It's normal in terms of um, nature, kind of like here in Australia, where there's a period of the year where that is sort of, it's easier to happen and easier to spread and harder to control. Um, but one of the differences is that in Brazil, generally almost all the fires are man-made and they have an economic um, objective. Now the government comes in in that aspect because it's up to the government. I mean, the Brazilian Amazon takes up about two territory. If you took the Brazilian Amazon and juxtaposed it to Australia, that would be close to about 70% of the Australian territory would be the Amazon. So it's an area that just physically it's very hard to be, um, to, to have an on the ground control. And that's why you need the role of the federal government to coordinate with the state government and the municipal government and all sorts of um, levels to really have um, the ability to assess what's going on, the ability then after assessing to be sending people to the ground to stop what's going on before it sort of spreads, to be able to punish people um, that are doing the wrong things. And that's where with Bolsonaro it gets um, a bit more complicated because you do have a, a different perception um, and that resonates more with something that the military would have not everybody in the military but many in the military in the 1960s to the 1980s that really the main role of the Amazon or one of the big roles is to bring economic development to Brazil the issue that I come to the controversy is because last year, um, Bolsonaro really went hard on NGOs, sort of claiming that foreign NGOs were the ones responsible for uh, starting uh, burning. Uh, both men, unsurprisingly, are really upset with, um, with Greta Thunberg, um, the teenage um, activist. Uh, environmental activist, um, but but it sort of gotten, uh, I mean, uh, quite under, over, no, out of control last year when, I mean, President Bolsonaro even suggested that people like Leonardo DiCaprio, the actor, were sort of involved financing Greenpeace and Greenpeace was the one doing all the destruction. So th there's an element of, um, I mean, some people have put it as paranoia. Others will say, no, he's just saying it like it is and it's, it's Brazil's area, and nobody from outside should be meddling into Brazil's own domestic affairs, um, that international actors are acting with a lot of hypocrisy because they also do many wrong things, so who are they to be judging Brazil? But um, it, is, it is coming now to sort of that phase again, and because of this concern, what's going on in Brazil is actually something quite interesting where you actually have a lot of agricultural exporting companies. They are the ones who are trying to domestically push the government to be doing more control over the Amazon because they know that they're the ones who are generally the first to be affected by all sorts of boycotts. And there was just a letter um, that came out, I think, 
or two ago with these, I don't know how many billions of dollars these companies together have, but essentially an Oprah letter saying to the Brazilian government that, look, if, if actual, you know, concrete action isn't done to preserve the Amazon, um, that they would start boycotting or they would not be selling things to Brazil. They would be limiting. So a series of things. So you have an interesting scenario now. And there's been talk, especially for the past, I think, 10 days of um, the Minister of Environment to be the one falling because he's the one where um, a lot of people are, are, he doesn't have a lot of supporters, I would say. And I think I'd go here, I'm looking at the clock just to be, I'm sure, on time, is to go to one of the first things that we were, um, that Alistair was talking about is that yesterday, President Bolsonaro did get, um, he had a confirmation. I've also kind of said, but it's not, it's not COVID. It's just a normal flu. Um, that yes, that he is, uh, he's positive for, um, for COVID. That in itself has caused, I mean, is, is almost unbelievable. Some people even don't think he has COVID, um, which already is interesting in itself. I mean, to say, well, you have the president saying, and people say, no, he actually doesn't have it because he might just be using, uh, you know, possible positive uh, result to be covering for all of the things that are going on this week politically in Brazil, including his son being, um, having to testify for, you know, the things that he's accused of and a whole bunch of different elements. But both men, unfortunately, have not been doing well in terms of administering the, the, the coronavirus situation. So in Brazil, of course, these are very big countries. Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world. We have over 200 million people. Um, there's a lot of problems in terms of infrastructure, in terms of health. So in, in one way, you can expect the numbers to be higher just because the, the, the number of people, right? 200 million people. Um, the numbers now as far, they are very unreported, but the official numbers are 1.7 million people confirmed. Um, and almost 70,000 people dead from COVID. And the number keeps climbing, almost the number of daily people that have been confirmed um, to have died from COVID it has been over a thousand for days, if not a couple of weeks. And unfortunately, it doesn't yet seem that we are at a situation of normalcy, of going into a plateau. Of course, certain areas of the country, because the country is huge, certain areas have been um, less bad, if I may, than others, but it's a very difficult situation. And in the middle of this, we are, I think, 55 or 56 days without a health minister because of political issues. There was one that was actually a quite popular um, health minister. He was, he was someone that regardless of where people stood ideologically, he had something like over 70, 80% of, you know, approval people saying that they were liking the, the job that he was doing, but he did go head to head with um, a Bolsonaro regarding hydroxychloroquine. Um, he didn't want to make it as, you know, the prescribed thing or have everybody taking this medication for COVID. And I mean, some people say also it had to do with political jealousy because he was getting more attention. But in any case, that one left. And then there was another minister for about a month. And now we've been without a minister in the middle of you know the the, the pandemic um it's a bit interesting to see similar to the u.s reality how you've had uh federalism brazil's a federation as the u.s as canada as australia but it, it resonates more the style of how this was approached more to the u.s than to australia where in australia the feeling is that you actually had really um, there's, there was this very strong role of the, the federal government and the, the state governments. And they seem, I mean, as someone living here for two years, the perception that I had is that generally it was a cooperative situation. In Brazil, this is not really the case. Uh, it, you're having basically most governors, we have 27 states, so most governors sort of really imposing the more um, harsher rules in terms of, of lockdown and containment and the federal government 
it, the executive in the federal government is the one who's really saying, no, we have to be looking at jobs and we have to be opening everything up. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, Bolsonaro could have done a lot more. I think um, I'm yet to find maybe a Brazilian who says, no, he, he did everything that he could. He said some things that I think should not be said by of uh, a country when Brazil had 10,000, um, we registered 10,000 dead, uh, someone asked him about that and he basically, his answer was quite literally, so what, idai? And sort of this idea that, quite nihil nihilistic I think, almost like, well, everybody dies, uh, so, you know, people are gonna die for different reasons and basically if you're really sick is that you're gonna die and, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it, 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 it's a difficult moment because I feel very comfortable being here in Australia. I feel very, very fortunate, um, notwithstanding what's going on in Melbourne, what has happened here. I don't want to minimize that. But once you look at Brazil and our, her family is there, mine, my husband's, um, and you look and it's just, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it, 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 it gets to you to see how much better we could be doing because Brazil does have the potential to do a lot better. Um, I'll just go here with the final things. And then with, again, it's not necessarily, I think, Say, but what you have is just, I think anybody who really embraces sort of a populist, uh, you know, playbook as saying here in CNN is bound to be unsuccessful dealing with a virus because a virus does not care about your tweets. A virus does not care about how strong you appear to be. Um, there's, there's really, there's no judgment when it comes to the virus in that sense. And I mean, even Bolsonaro apparently it just came out in the media, I looked at it this morning, saying that in a, a meeting not very long ago, um, somebody was coming in with the meeting wearing masks, and he made the comment that, you know, kind of jokingly and saying, oh, that's so gay, like homosexuals, you know, it's like it's not a manly thing to be wearing masks. And again, there is this element of, of Trump, I think, with um, a very particular view of of what it is to be a man or a leader um, and unfortunately it is not really doing that well when it comes to COVID and I'll just finish off here it's kind of a mm, 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 you know wah, 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 kind of sad for the two of them but it's the, the image that I wanted to show with this is just to show how the two of them are each one dealing with their own particular problems domestically. So there is no doubt that Trump, I mean, from, you know, the U.S. election is coming. His numbers don't appear to be good in any way. Um, Brazil is expected also to have um, municipal level elections now in October, although it's probably going to be postponed at least for a bit. Things are not going well. Um, Bolsonaro's popularity, he's not growing any followers. So his base is strong, but it's one where instead of increasing and instead of gaining, it has basically been um, shrinking. And I think it's one thing to be elected saying, I am change. I am not the past. I'm different. But being different is not a policy in itself, right? You need to show, you need to have results. Um, and I think there's this element of an increasing frustration. Of course, COVID is neither of these men fault, it's no one's fault, but how you deal with it, they do bear a strong responsibility for um, trust building, for confidence building, for really the sense of leadership. So um, it will be very interesting to see. Uh, I think as a political scientist, I'm not gonna say I'm happy, but I'm curious to see how these things will play out in the case of, of again, if you don't like Trump, it's looking like um, he's not going to have a second turn. And if that is the case, Bolsonaro would really have to sort of rearrange his foreign policy because right now a lot, a lot of, um, let's say, the bets are sort of put, you know, stacked up in this special relationship with the, the United States. But if um, Trump is gone, I don't see any reason why um, a Biden will want to have, you know, this very, very special and different relationship with Brazil. So on that note, I will hopefully right on time, 
proud of myself at exactly 35 minutes. Perfect. I that, did it. <laughs> thank you. That, that was really excellent. Very wide ranging. We've, we've got lots of questions coming in. We'll get through as many as we can. Some are, some are COVID related, some are political, but I think uh, to lead probably seamlessly on from COVID, um, what's the process of replacement if a Brazilian president is unable to continue in office? Um, so the official thing would be you have the, the, the vice president and the vice president, and that's where things begin to be quite interesting. So I've, I've you know, people in Brazil who really follow politics say that, um, what's the name, uh, House of Cards? Was it the, the, the show? It's like, oh, that's, that's for children. That's for beginners. They, but the idea is that you would probably have the vice president, um, who's a general, Mourão, he would probably take over. Now, Bolsonaro had had, has had his series of health issues. Um, he was, you know, stabbed, although some people even question if he was stabbed, but let's assume he was stabbed indeed. Um, he did go into hospital and everything, and the, the, especially him and his kids made a point that he would still be signing off. So as of now, um, it doesn't look like he's going to relinquish power because there's a real that especially the military will be more loyal to the military and not necessarily to the president. And given what we've had with um, Dilma and her vice president, Michelle Temer, and other stories in Latin America, there is this concern that once the vice president sort of has this flavor really for power, that they might actually want to stay. And again, the problem with Bolsonaro is that his base is falling. So it's not like it's something where you would have, you know, millions and millions of people on the street crying because of them. Um, so it, it would be sort of a, a, a tricky situation, although it does not appear that he is in a really bad shape. But you don't know with COVID, right? You can be well and then afterwards unwell. But so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Is there, a, is there a, a, an anti-Bolsonaro um, press? Uh, or how, how, how does the press relate to him? Um, if you a supporter all press is anti-bolsonaro press i guess you can put it like that so again kind of like trump with oh the mainstream media they only want to talk about bad things so there's people saying why is the media focusing only on the deaths we should be focusing on the people who have recovered and i mean that's one way of seeing it but i do think that regardless if it's left or right if you like the government or not it is the role of journalists to be really asking the the um, you don't want to be throwing softballs. Hey, how was your day? It's like, no, what are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Um, but it's, it's been challenging. So, for example, there are a couple of newspapers, the equivalent of the New York Times or Washington Post, that the government now, the federal government canceled uh, the, the um, subscription to. So in order to sort of make a, a stance and then sometimes is giving um, press releases like the one when he said he was COVID, he only invited four um, journalists and all of them were really like pro-government. So basically, if you are very pro-Bolsonaro, you're gonna say everything in the media is against Bolsonaro. They won't let him work. They're just out to get them. However, I would think for most people, it's no, they're reporting. They're, they're doing their, their job and their reporting and it's up to people to sort of siphon through but it is a process again once you have um this ample availability of sources a lot of people do migrate to sources who kind of um you know preach to the choir and that end up being more of echo chambers that say oh these are the good things and they won't question they won't do anything just drawing the comparison between Bolsonaro and Trump, uh, points we made, Trump has a very strong geographical basis to his support in the States. Are, are there any particular regions of Brazil that show particularly strong support or opposition to Bolsonaro? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So 
in terms of election, you do see in general, especially the northeast of Brazil, um, Bolsonaro didn't do as well. Like that was probably the region where he really didn't do as well. He's still like his numbers are always um, on, a, on a lower scale. And he did do better from sort of Rio downward. So more on the southern half of uh, Brazil. But what's happening now, but I don't think it's as clear cut, because in Brazil, you really see that sort of core, but it's not only about Trump, it has also to do with the Republican Party, and where a lot of, um, let's say, more evangelical groups are that tends to overlap all of these elements into the southern part of the United States. Now, in Brazil, it's different, because you have, for instance, if you look at evangelical voters, they're all around um, the country. If you look in terms of um, of race, there might be an element there, but still there's a lot of very, there, there are more, certainly the lower you go in Brazil, the more south you go in Brazil, the, the wider it tends to be. But race isn't the only element, um, or at least it isn't as strong as it is in the United States. So it's there, but not so much. Um, yeah, in Brazil, I think it's, that's what also makes it complicated because you'll see people in you know, different um, economic brackets, the, the, the support might be the same, the support might change. So there's no one exact sort of group. The only thing I would say really is that sort of the Northeast of Brazil, where, where I'm from, is where you have really, it's a much stronger hold of the, the Workers' Party, so Lula and Dilma, and it's where Bolsonaro never did really well, and he's not, he hasn't improved since he was elected. You'd mentioned the um, evangelical voters and a couple of questions about the role of the church. I wanted, are there any connections between the rise of populism in Brazil and growing power of evangelical churches at the expense of, say, the, the Catholic church? Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, that's a, a, a really good question. And it also poses um, some things that are different when you look at um, generally Latin America and especially Christian, Catholic, um, Catholicism. So generally, you've had in a lot of countries in Latin America, a Catholic church that is quite progressive. So in the case of Brazil, for example, it was the Catholic church who did a lot of the political pushing for um, people with AIDS and HIV in the early 90s. It was the church who really pushed that that sort of um, um, flag, that sort of battle. So you have in general, um, it's, it's almost like, I mean, in Brazil, if you look into, I think up until the 60s or 70s, over 90% of Brazilians were Catholic. But the number has been going down. Nowadays, the number is probably a, around two thirds of Brazilian Christians are Catholics and evangelicals are growing more and more. And uh, in a lot of the, the, the Catholics, I think you'll find a lot of people who are more, let's say, culturally Catholic. So you're Catholic and you, you know, you, you do the rituals, you celebrate certain things, but you're not necessarily um, as invested in that identity in a way that really is the motivator for you to vote. So it's one of the elements of the identity, but you will see more frequently. So for example, you will have a lot of evangelical um, leaders, pastors, have been elected to the legislative. You won't see um, priests being elected to legislators. So there's these different divides. And in Brazil, the, the, the evangelical group that probably has the biggest power is the one who unfortunately tends to be more predatory. It tends to be, and by predatory, I mean, it's a group that is more related to the sort of um, church of, I think they call prosperity, the, the gospel of prosperity, that it's really, you know, you give money and then that seed is going to, you know, make God give you something else afterwards. And so it's, it's, it's predatory in the sense, because it's not so much about a church that is about helping someone else, but it's really about... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to flatten the discussion and say every evangelical in Brazil is like that because it's not. But it's just that that seems to be um, almost, if you think in the U.S., the equivalent of the tele-evangelists, you know, the really big arenas and you really see a whole lot of money. They have private jets. They have a whole bunch of things. So they, they are really, they've sort of 
so Bolsonaro is not exactly of that group, but he really attached himself and they have attached themselves to Bolsonaro to really raise um, and really gain a lot of power. And that was very good. Thank you. In, in terms of um, government and governance, does, does Bolsonaro have to work with, with a Congress that he controls? And, and, and could you also just, or Lydia, just talk a bit more about the role of the military and, and how, how he's running? Things? Yeah. No, those are also uh, uh, good questions. And well, that is very different, the Brazilian system from the American system, because in the US, basically, you have two main powers. And then if one power has, you know, the, the, the majority, somebody's got a majority, minority, and it sort of sets the pace. Well, in Brazil's Congress right now, there is, I think there's only maybe one or two parties that are in the double digits. Everybody, I think the biggest one might be the Workers' Party, and they might have something like 16%, 17% of everybody there. There's over 30 parties in Congress, and almost all of them are like 9%, 8%, 4%, 3%. So it, it makes it different. I mean, and that I will say, whether it's Bolsonaro, Dilma, Lula, Cardozo, whoever is in power, it is a tricky process because you really have to sort of weave this coalition and they're, they're tiny. So it's not like you can just go and, you know, make a coalition with, let's say, two big groups and you're set. Usually that's going to involve a lot of these small parties. And on the one hand, you can say, hey, that's great because that makes it democratic. Right. You can say that's great because it means that you have to listen to many voices and you have to be more democratic. The downside is that these parties, a lot of them know that they will only the government gives them a good deal. So it's I will be by your side, but I want the Ministry of Transportation. I want my person to be the director of the National Agency for Aviation, whatever you have. So you end up having um, a system that is bound to be problematic for anybody who's in power. So that whether, you know, you like Bolsonaro or Dilma, you know, whomever, that is a challenge that all of them um, have to face. But we are living now in a pretty weird situation where um, the the I think the president of the Senate and the president of the, the, the you know, House of Representatives, I don't think they've ever had this much real political capital. I mean, legally, they still have the same powers they did before, but because there's the government has no experience, really. One of the downsides of being new is that it means you've never done this before. So it ends up being, there's, a, a, again, a downside of being new is that you are an amateur. And because of this lack of ability of really know how the system works, which again can be really bad because you say, ha, I know how it works. I give money to this one. I give a, you know, you kind of everything is stacked. But it also means it's dysfunctional because you do have to talk to the other powers. And that's why you have, for instance, um, we've had a, a pro Bolsonaro manifestations with people with ban the Supreme Court which is absolutely appalling, but it's because the Supreme Court is saying, no, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, or, you know, no, this is what the law is saying, this is what the law is saying. And then again, with populism, it's easy to say, I'm trying to do everything, it is them, the Supreme Court, and they are the bad guys, they are the ones who are not allowing me to work. So it's, it's the, you, you pass the buck. Right, the responsibility. So if nothing gets done, it's the Congress's fault. It's the media's fault. It's um, it's everybody's fault, but the leader itself. Well, that that actually brings us quite neatly onto to the next question, which is just: Could you talk a little bit more about um, Bolsonaro's interactions with the judiciary? Yes. So that again, that is a very tricky one because, for instance, Bolsonaro, Dilma, Lula, all of them had their issues, obviously very different issues with the judiciary, but the tendency for most people who are in party, who are in, in powers to say, um, when the judiciary is going after me, it's politically biased. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes it is true. And sometimes it is the case that yes, it is politically biased. But again, most uh, people in po politics and politicians in power, their default position is to say everything is political. This is not a legal judgment. It is political. So 
in in you will see again bolsonaro supporters saying that the 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 investigations going after um his son his sons going after um his allies there's a lot of investigation around the use of fake news and sort of this this excuse me this um really sort of hateful use of social media um, this is not about fake news. It's about attacking the president. It's not about what, um, you know, Flavio Bolsonaro or the, the, the Carlos Bolsonaro have done. It's really about Jair Bolsonaro and everybody's going after sort of the president. So I think it's sort of a common narrative. I don't find it surprising. And it is challenging, I will say, always. If you are, if you have the Supreme Court analyzing things related to the president, they will always be political just because you can't really detach but that doesn't mean that it's done in bad faith right that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going over the law it doesn't mean that you're manipulating the law sometimes it just happens that the person did wrong things um but yes it's uh one of bolsonaro's sons the one i showed with um with uh, bannon he was one that he said once it's like oh yeah we only need like a, a jeep and two soldiers to close the supreme court like quite flippantly um and obviously most people in brazil are like i don't think that's a good idea i think you know you you it it, it, it just yeah it doesn't make sense and then finally just to go with the in, in terms of the the um, the um, armed forces, the military, the challenge is that you have a situation where the only personnel who are very vocal, um, and most of them pro Bolsonaro, tend to be the ones that are retired. The people that are inactive by the position that they have, they don't do interviews to the press. They're not tweeting about how they love or how they hate you know, the president, because they're inactive. And that is what brings a lot of people, like I'm, I'm in a group where a lot of people do investigate this relationship, and it's hard to sort of filter out, you know, how much support does he really, really have? And that, I think, is kind of a black box. Um, I hope we don't have to open it. Let's, you know, let the military stay where they are. They have their role. But I don't think it is their role to be, in power in this way it's it's it's, it's a very very dangerous um you know uh, position to be in where you can say oh i am above um you know the narrative i am above the political parties i am above ideologies i only care about the nation and you can use that as a narrative it's a strong narrative very dangerous and very easy to slip into something extremely problematic just to follow up a little bit more on the, on the role of the military, it, is that Bolsonaro bringing them in for support or are they, are they imposing themselves on him, so to speak? Uh, that's, well, I would like to know if the, you know, how much of the second part is true. I think he is inviting a lot um, up until his election. Because now, I mean, with his election, you sort of really shifted the role of the military in, in, the, in the zeitgeist of Brazil. Because obviously after um, the end of a dictatorship in 84, they were really, really set to, to, to the side. And actually Bolsonaro, like a lot of the things that he ended up being elected in the state of Rio and then going to Brasilia was because like, as a legislator was looking into um, military, issues like um you know support for widows or um uh pensioners this this sort of you know increased salary so it was really it's, it was a sectoral defense that was his sector that is what he worked with and he does bring people to this stage that are people who will agree with him some of them are people who are his contemporaries from when he was in um in power but also because again pre-2019 the military actually were able to build a very good reputation as an institution in brazil a very trustworthy institution they were not meddling in any sort of politics since you know the 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 end of the the the, the military dictatorship so they were seen as you know 
I'm not going to say good guys because that's pushing it, but they were seen as, you know, a serious institution that's not really meddling in, in the political life. Now the problem is that it appears that there's a lot of discussion inside of people in the military, you know, people active duty and people outside of active duty between how much should we attach ourselves? Are we, there's an expression, it's like, are we hugging the drowning man? You know, is this what we want to do? Because the problem is the moment you really, really begin to attach to Bolsonaro and Bolsonaro falls, the military is going to fall in terms of reputation as well. So I think that this discussion this year, it's where it's going into um, a direction that maybe last year we kind of flagged that it would happen. But I think this year it's like, I think you actually have discussions on how much should the military really be involved. And if it doesn't want to be involved, what do we do? Do, do they all leave or do they stay and stay and demand certain things? Um, but the fact that Bolsonaro did put someone as his vice president, put him in a really difficult position because he can't fire him. And literally the number two, the person whom I want your job is someone who you cannot fire. So it, it is, again, interesting times to be studying Brazilian politics. Could, could you briefly just comment on the current security situation, crime and, and violence? Um, well, that was also one of the big things that uh, Bolsonaro was elected on. And I mean, a lot of cities in Brazil have been struggling with, um, with crime, a lot of it related to organized crime, with, um, there's a lot of levels we have problems. Again, different areas in Brazil will have different problems. Where I'm from, a city called Fortaleza, there's, I mean, the numbers there are horrible in terms of uh, violent homicides, and it has a lot to do with uh, drug trafficking. But it it's the problem of not having enough mons, funds, enough money for, um, for the police. There are problems in the judiciary that are very slow. Um, there is, similar to the United States, abuse of power by the police. So that also makes the police not really trustworthy um, for people to be, you know, I can't even call the police because I don't even trust. They might be just as bad as, you know, the bad guys. And, you know, who, what am I going to do? So... Bolsonaro really also got elected on this platform of, again, law and order and saying, I will restore order. And once I'm ruling and everybody will kind of, you know, shake in their places and things will, will be right again, will be good again. But I think reality is proven a lot more complex. And it's not by, I mean, he also wants him and his sons, like they really want everybody to be full of weapons and guns. Um, and I mean, at the one hand, you can say, oh, that's great, because, you know, if someone comes after me or my family, I'm just going to shoot them down. But that's not real life. And um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 an, I'm an optimist, so I'm hopeful that solutions will be found. But I don't think that the ones that the government are using are the ones who will get us there. We're, we've got time for, well, a, a, a couple more, maybe a few more. We might go slightly over time, perhaps. I'm fine. Not just, but um, <laughs> just again with the, the uh, a contrast with the US or comparison. Um, yeah. You talked about the federal system and, and states and municipalities. Trump has to deal with um, state governors, and that, that's a bit of a handbrake sometimes on what he, he can do or, or can yeah. get done. Yeah. Is there a parallel in, in Brazil with that system? Yes, and um, but it's in many ways it's sort of new and unique because Brazil has a system of federalism that is extremely centralized. So if you think Australia, Canada, United States have now lived, I, I, I joke around and say I'm moving along large federations because those are four countries that I've lived. Maybe I'm missing out, you know, Russia. Um, what happens is, is that Brazil is first a unitary state and then it became a federation. So our structure wasn't that the states had all this independence and ceded some of their power to the federation. It's actually the opposite, is that you had a unitary system. And once it broke down into the federation, it was about giving these sort of minor things to the states. So historically, states in Brazil, they, they've never really been this sort of big competition or big political force. In, in sort of this federated, like a coordinated federated different 
the federal executive and the state level executives because they've never had really that much power. They could talk about, you know, the sort of like uh, tariffs that go between state and federal governments, you know, royalties from oil that is discovered in a state and a federal. What this case is different is that the Supreme Court did rule that um, states and municipalities, but especially focusing on states, they could have, they could do things, um, they could take initiatives in terms of public health that were not dependent on the federal government. So that was one of really the big key things because it allowed um, state governments. And what you have is basically most governors saying, look, I'm looking at this from the lens of experts. I'm the one who's actually looking at my hospitals being filled up and, you know, having to deal with all these problems. And so what you have is essentially, an, I'm not going to say new phenomenon, but a pretty unusual phenomenon is to have the majority of these governors coming together and really working as a political entity, which is something that we haven't really seen. So it is different from the US because in the US it's almost expected. You know that this is how the system is. And for instance, in Brazil, the civil law is the same in all states. Criminal law is the same in all states. We don't have this sort of variation. Um, so it is interesting to see governors really coming together as a political force against a position from the, the president and the, the governors, regardless of sort of their affiliation. You had governors from, from different, it wasn't just leftist governments. It, there was most, really the majority of governors um, coming together and saying, look, I'm seeing this from the ground. And, you know, COVID is not a little flu. COVID is going to kill a lot of people. And so that's why you sort of see this different tension. I think Bolsonaro is really the one who holds a lot more of ideology in his decision-making process. And it's not to say that there is an ideology in, in, in governors, but I think it's a lot more toned down um, than it is with, with the, the leader of the federal executive. Um, well, we're probably, probably getting to the point of a, a last question. We, we, it's a great sign of a great talk. If you've got lots and you can't get through them, but just to, to wrap up, a little hypothetical. Sure. <laughs> possibly unfair, but... Um, What's, what's the potential for a healthy working relationship between Bolsonaro administration and a potential Biden administration oh. after January, if, if that was to happen? Well, God knows. Okay, so um, at, at, at its face, doesn't look good given um, the, the, a lot of the way, and I mean, again, it has to do with sort of this populist approach is that the relationship is in between the countries, it's between the leaders. You know, if it wasn't for me, this deal wouldn't have happened. Um, again, populists left and right, they, they, they tend to do this. It's very, very personalized. Um, now, it, it would put Brazil in a, in a difficult situation. However, I do think that if we have a different minister of foreign affairs, because the one that we have now is one of the most hardcore in this really ideological um, sort of approach. He's someone who, from every report that I read, it's someone that he's not um, taken seriously, or at least let's say he's not someone who is admired inside the institution. And he doesn't really have a lot of friends, I think, all around. He has a very, very specific view of how Brazilian foreign policy should be conducted. And it is a glaring disparity from everything that the institution has had in the past. It's a very, the, the Brazilian diplomatic um, core is almost like a military core and having, you know, this history, this prix de corps, this sort of very clear identity of what they are, what they do, how you do it. This is a major, major rupture. But all the media, at least, you know, all of the gossip that you see is that from the past like 10 days, um, is that he might be one to fall. And I think if you have a more, you know, a more normal in the sense of someone who would really fit all the typical criteria to be in the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs. And there are, I mean, the number of diplomats is just phenomenal, the quality. There, there's no lack of, of, you know, 
people that have the capacity to really do um, good for Brazil, but it, it's up to the president. The president is the one who actually has, has to choose. Now, the question is, you know, how much is the president willing to, because he's in a pendulum, he has a lot of the support from this ideological core, but not everybody else. The moment that he tries to break from this bubble and gain more support from other groups that are not ideological, he can be painted as, um, you know, turning his back on the real and turning back on the people who voted for him. So it's very hard, I think, for him to have it both ways. Because the moment he gains and, you know, sort of gets into a system that is less ideological, the people who are with him will probably be the first ones on the street to be saying, you, you're a traitor to the real values. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to be able, like how he's going to be able to square off um, these very different groups. Because again, if the economy is going well, people can tolerate a lot of things. If you have job, if you know, you're, you're, if things are going okay, people are a lot more willing to tolerate, you know, bad behavior. Um, but it's when the tide is down, I think it's uh, Warren Buffett that said it's when the tide is down that you see who's been swimming naked, right? So it's, <laughs> Now that, you know, when things are not well, and the, the, I mean, COVID has been bad for everybody. And I think it's really revealing the cracks. It's really revealing things that are like, okay, this can no longer be seen as politics as usual, because we're not living in a world as usual. So I don't know. And I will say one thing, anybody who's very certain about Brazilian politics doesn't know what's going on. Because... <laughs> It's full of surprises. It's full of things. And I mean, you get the picture. The one thing that's constant is that there's always something happening because of the time difference. When I wake up here, it's at the end of the day in Brazil. So I'm suddenly flooded by everything that's happened during the day. And, and it's, uh, again, it, it doesn't cease to amaze me. But again, I am an optimist. And I do think that the fact that we still have um, a very critical media that we still have, um, you know, despite its problems, institutions that are still doing their job or the basic contours of their job, I think it's, it's a good sign. It's um, maybe in the big, big picture, it can be seen as growing pains. Again, I am, I am an optimist. My, my husband sometimes looks at me and he's like, what are you saying, woman? He doesn't really, <laughs> he's not, but I don't know. I think, I think we have to, I'm, I'm a believer that, you know, the, the arch, what's that? The long arch of justice sort of bends, you know, forward and things can get less bad. They might not be perfect, but they can get less bad. Well, I, th I think that's a, a very good uh, point to, to draw proceedings to a close on. <laughs> we have run slightly over time, but I think uh, it was definitely worth spending the time. Um, Deb, thank you very much. We've had fee great feedback in coming in, just very, such detail and wide ranging and, and interesting discussion. So uh, really fantastic to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You everyone at home or wherever you are watching, um, everyone, please stay well, or from, from lockdown in Melbourne to <laughs> uh, yes. stay well, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be reconvening in person before too long, but really excellent. Deb, thank you very much for coming on. Great to see you. Thank you all. Boa noite. Obrigada. <laughs>